Shalom, I'm Chris, and let's follow Jesus along the Talmudim way. Lesson 23, we are calling this the coming one. We'll be in Luke chapter 7 and a little bit of Matthew 8 and Matthew 11. We always start with Acts 17, 11. These Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. We do not take anyone's single word for it. We always want to back it up and check everything out against scripture. Busy chapter. Um, we're going to have to do this in two parts. So the first part, we'll look at Jesus coming down from the mountain after giving the Sermon on the Mount. And then Matthew will uh, insert this episode of cleansing the leper. Now, Matthew has some very definite reasons for inserting that here, and we'll look a little bit at Matthew's organization of uh, the, the chapters following the Sermon on the Mount. We're not going to go into those in detail, but I uh, just want to, to get you a, a bird's eye view of what's happening there. Uh, then we'll back to Luke, we'll be uh, see the scene of healing a centurion servant in Capernaum. And then we'll conclude part one with raising a widow's son in the town of Nain. Then in part two, we'll we'll get to the really the main event is John sending messengers from Macarus where he is in prison, and he'll send them with a very specific question, and that's actually the title of our uh, episode: Are you the coming one, or should we look for someone else? And there's a lot of lessons that we can draw from that question and Jesus's reaction to it. And we'll see Jesus has a favorable reaction to the question. He doesn't chide him or doesn't say anything about lack of faith. Uh, he ends up commending John in the strongest of terms. So Jesus answers that question and he just says, yes, uh, we want him to come out and say, yes, I am. Uh, you know, it's all is good, but he doesn't do that. He he does say yes, though. He just, as my friend Rich Ferreira at GTI Tours says, he says, yes, he just does it Jewish. So he, he does it in a very Jewish style and he's going to cite a bunch of uh, texts from from Isaiah and Malachi that uh, that prove who he is. And then uh, we'll wrap it up with the house of Simon the Pharisee and the sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet. And then uh, we'll include the uh, first few verses of chapter 8 in Luke with three Talmidot. And Talmidot is the feminine plural of Talmidim. So when you have a group of uh, only women, you would call them Talmidot. If it's only men or mixed men or women, you would call them Talmidim. So these three women disciples, and they're not just any ordinary disciples, they are disciples that had some significant financial means. And so it's very interesting and maybe challenges a bit of our role, uh, our thoughts of the role of women in that culture, that uh, we see quite a few women who, who did, apparently uh, did a lot better uh, financially than a lot of the men were doing. So uh, we'll pick that up in, in part two. So we are in Galilee, and box four is the uh, where the Sermon on the Mount is. We've just finished that. He's going to come down from Capernaum, and uh, come down from the mountain to Capernaum, and then he's going to follow that yellow line leading out from box four down to the Jezreel Valley, and he will pass by Mount Tabor. Uh, he'll come pretty close to Nazareth. You can see the yellow line on the upper left of the screen there. And he'll come to this uh, town called Nain, uh, it's uh, on the northern side of the hill of Moray. On the southern side of that hill is a town called Shunem, where a nearly identical miracle occurred back in the Old Testament. So we'll look at that. Meanwhile, John is in prison on the east side of the Jordan in, a, in the land of Perea in a town called Macris. And you can see Macris way at the bottom on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. That box might be hard to read, but it says John the Baptist imprisoned and murdered. And we know this is the location, not so much from the Bible, but from Josephus, who records that John the Baptist was imprisoned because uh, Herod Antipas thought that he was a threat. And uh, jo Josephus knows that he was in prison in uh, this fortress uh, palace at Macris. And so for this episode, it's important to remember that Herod Antipas ruled over these two non-adjoining regions. We're familiar with Galilee, or maybe less familiar with uh, Perea on the east side of the Jordan. After Jesus' birth narrative, it's important to note that in the Gospels, whenever you see Herod and no other qualification, it's more than likely referring to Herod Antipas. When we get to Acts, you'll see Herod, it will be a different Herod. Uh, like the old baseball saying goes, you can't tell the players without a scorecard. So let's dig in and let's pick it up with uh, Matthew 8, 1. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him, and a man with leprosy came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. 
Jesus reached out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. It's important to note that most of Matthew is not in chronological order. Mark and Luke will place this cleansing at the beginning of Jesus' Galilean ministry. So in other words, we already looked at it. Uh, Mark 1.41 and Luke 5.13. But there is something interesting about why Matthew places that um, this episode here immediately following the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll look at that on the next slide. Keener suggests that Matthew moves this miracle here because in Matthew 8 and 9, he is deliberately grouping 10 miracles, which is reminiscent of the 10 miracles of Moses, and he's interspersing that with various teachings on discipleship. And so as we go verse by verse, where we get in, in the nitty gritty and we try to unpack what, what the words say, but at, from time to time, it's very helpful to take a step back and just appreciate the literary mastery of the Bible. So for, we had in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where the Sermon on the Mount, and then he's going to follow that with three miracles, the leper cleanse, which you just read, uh, the healing of the centurion's son, which is actually a Gentile uh, re recipient, and then Peter's mother-in-law, which will be a Jewish recipient. Then he's going to have another teaching on discipleship, the cost of following Jesus, and then three more miracles, the calming of the storm, the demon at Gadara, and the paralyzed man at Capernaum. And, and we assume, just like the first group of three, those are Jewish, Gentile, and Jewish. Um, the Gadara was a region in the Gentile Decapolis, and of course we've got pigs, so um, you know, very Gentile feeling. Calming of the storm was in the probably in the northern end of the Sea of Galilee with, with the on the Jewish side of, of the lake. And then back in Capernaum, we've, we've got the Jewish town of the paralyzed man. And then another teaching on discipleship, this will be the call of Matthew and the resulting discourse that uh, Jesus has at the banquet of the um, the tax collectors. We looked at that previously, but in Matthew's chron chronology, chronology uh, he's placing it here. Then we've got three more miracles. One of those is a double miracle. So we've got Jairus's daughter, uh, a, a Jewish, he's a synagogue uh, leader. Two blind men, probably Jewish, because they say, have mercy on a son of David, so they acknowledge him as, as the son of David. And then a mute demoniac, which is, we don't know, that's possibly Gentile. Demons tend to be more of a Gentile problem than a Jewish problem, although uh, it's not unheard of that uh, that Jewish people in that day would be demon-possessed, as we will see with uh, Mary Magdalene at the, at the end of this lesson. So that's just a look at why Matthew arranges it the way he does. He's, he's not intending to be uh, chronological. However, since we are trying to go mostly chronological, we tend to follow Luke. And we remember from the beginning, Luke's goal was to write an orderly account. So uh, we'll, we will stick with, with Luke's narrative. So Luke 7, 1, after he finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, meaning the Sermon on the Mount, he came down from the mountain and it says he entered Capernaum. And where you can see the trees in the center left uh, of the picture on the horizon, that's the traditional location of the Sermon on the Mount. So not that far, a few miles down the slope to Capernaum, uh, which you can see in the foreground here. Matthew 8, 1 and Luke 7, 1 can rightly be considered the closing verses of the Sermon on the Mount. And then Luke is going to head off in verse 2 with the, the next narrative. Now, a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. Now, this episode is remarkable on a number of levels. We have to remember the, the tension of that day. Jews and Romans were enemies of one another. And there are a number of cultural divisions that will become apparent from this text and, and by the reaction of the centurion's uh, either representatives or the centurion himself, depending on which narrative we're looking at. But we have a, a combination of the centurions honoring the Jews, and then of course Jesus's reaction to that with his love and the reputation that he has that, that we're able to break through all this. And it's very interesting. We, uh, we don't see Jesus turning down any uh, anyone who comes to him in in sincerity and faith, and it's very interesting about that. Uh, he could just heal, and there were some episodes where he just walked up and healed. But um, frequently, it's it's at the request of someone, and then he he honors it. And uh, this reminds me when I uh, when when I was listening to Chuck Missler, he used to have a saying that was, "Without him, we can't, but without us, he won't." 
So for whatever reason, Jesus typically won't act unless we're engaged. And again, there's exceptions, but uh, we are not called to passivity. And it takes that first step of um, you know, reaching out to him and, and sincerity. And of course, the Spirit's guiding all this. So um, I, I love this, that the centurion shows faith. And even though cultural norms would say these two groups of people have to be separate, Jesus is going to bridge that divide. But it all begins with the, the centurion's faith. His Jewish followers are probably very puzzled at the very, uh, very fact that he's going to interact with a Roman Gentile sinner. When he heard about Jesus, he, the centurion, sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and save the life of his life. So uh, in Luke's account, he sends some intermediaries. In Matthew's account, it's the centurion directly comes to Jesus and says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home. When they came to him, uh, back to Luke uh, 7 verse 4, when they came to him, they strongly urged him saying, he is worthy for you to grant this to him for he loves our nation and it was he who built our synagogue. So perhaps one of the other, uh, one or the other, Luke or Matthew revised the story for clarity, while the other wrote it as it happened, or each simply remembered it differently. There's really no conflict here. It's like we've said, if you have two different witnesses at a trial, if if they corroborate the main facts, then both are telling the truth. We assume slight variations here are actually a good thing because what we see here is an absence of collusion. They were probably both working from Mark's gospel. We a lot of scholars presume Mark is the first one, and then Luke had that. And, and did some re other research, and Matthew had that and, and uh, put in his, uh, his viewpoint. Detectives are, are trained to spot when stories sound a little too similar, so it's a possible clue that both are lying, and we just don't have that in the gospel, so for that we can be thankful. This is the Capernaum synagogue, and although this synagogue is dated later to the 4th or 5th century, it is built on the foundation of a 1st century synagogue. And what's interesting here is if when we go here, we'll see that the main uh, pillars have inscriptions of the donors. So we, we connect this with the, the man loving the synagogue and, and built, loving the people and building the synagogue. Um, he, he might have had his name etched. So it's a very, um, a, a nice sign, right, that, that a Roman would um, support the Jewish people in that way. Some connect this passage with the long distance healing of the royal official son at the end of John 4. Um, a royal official probably would not have been a Roman, but likely someone in, in Herod's uh, court. Um, John places Jesus in Cana in that one, and the official is in Capernaum. So they're similar, but we, you know, Luke has the entire event taking place in Capernaum. So they're probably two different episodes. Now, Jesus started on his way with them, but already when he was not yet far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further. I am not worthy for you to enter my roof. For that reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant shall be healed. For I am also a man placed under authority and with soldiers under, under myself. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he doesn't, and he does it. So Matthew 8, again, has the, the servant speaking directly. The servant says, Lord, I am not worthy. So we suspect that this centurion is aware of these cultural differences, and observant Jews would not set foot in a Gentile's home, and this this servant, I'm sorry, this centurion wanted to respect that. Note that I, I pick up on the fact that he says, I am under authority. He doesn't say I'm in authority just like you. He says, I am under authority just like you. And that's a, a, another startling uh, admission that this Gentile recognized Jesus as being sent by God the Father. And I think that's a fascinating uh, phrase there that he says, I'm under authority just like you are. Now, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, rightly so, and turned to him and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave or the servant in good health. So Jesus appears like he's willing to go to the house, which is interesting. But after observing the remarkable faith of the Gentile, of course, Jesus knows what's going to happen. Um, and, and despite the fact here that the local leadership seems willing to grant him an exception, we're going to look the other way on our cultural divide because this, this is such a good person and we, we want to help him out. Jesus does hold back from what would certainly be viewed as a, as a provocation. So he does do the long distance healing. Consciously or unconsciously, many of us read the second half of verse 9. Uh, I say to you, I, not even in Israel I have found such a great faith. 
uh, we view that through a replacement theology lens, but uh, this is not at all a dig on Israel. He's basically saying, in Israel I have found faith, but this Gentile centurion's faith is something extraordinary. So we have to look at the context and a bit of the grammar there. Matthew adds a postscript referencing the Messianic age, which Luke will add later in his narrative. So we have, uh, I, I say to you, not even in Israel I have, have I found a great faith. And then Matthew continues, and I say to you that many will come from east and west, recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke is actually going to place this uh, passage a little bit later in his narrative. So we've got some uh, different editorial uh, insertions happening here. Isaiah declared the kingdom was for all peoples. And he's referencing a lot of Isaiah here. Uh, Isaiah 25, 6, Isaiah 56, 3 through 8. Um, although he said that the prevailing thought in that day was that the Messianic banquet was exclusively for Israel. And it's a good reminder that we are susceptible to the same interpretations. We like to read the scriptures that are pleasing to us and make us comfortable. And we sort of discount the scriptures that make us uncomfortable, even though our beliefs may conflict with what is actually written. And so that's why we start every lesson with Acts 17, 11. We have to keep in mind the whole counsel of God. We have to keep in mind that scripture is... is uh, the authority and, and not what we want scripture to say, but what scripture actually says. Jesus here is actually seeding a narrative that will become more developed over time and it will come to full blossom in Paul's writings, actually. what It is what one does with Jesus and not a bloodline that is the determining factor whether one dines at the Messianic table. So all, all Jews won't be excluded and all Gentiles won't be included. It will be a faithful remnant from each group who will be present. Now Luke's going to move on to the next narrative. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. So Jesus has a large crowd meeting this funeral procession head on. It's going to be quite interesting. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. So you imagine these two large groups on the same narrow road um, coming, coming to a head. So where is Nain? Nain is on the northern side of the hill of Moray. And very interesting because on the southern side of that hill is a town called Shunem. And the people of that day would have drawn an obvious parallel with what's about to happen here with Elisha's raising of the Shunamite, Shunamite woman's son in 2 Kings 4. Now, we miss this because we probably don't know our Old Testament as well as we should. People that day did not miss it at all. Uh, Nain comes from the Hebrew word naim, which means pleasant. And that comes from Genesis 49, 15. It's actually uh, quoted there. That uh, is, is, is the blessing on Ishakar. He uses that word, Naim. Nain is in the tribal allotment of Ishakar. And if you've read Ruth, you may remember that Naomi also means pleasant. And that's because it's the same root word. I love the Jezreel Valley because you're, you're driving through here and just about every direction, there's biblical history all around you, 360 degrees. So Mount Tabor, Endor is where uh, Saul was on the run and you know kind of running out of steam and he, he summons up Samuel and uh, he you know uses a medium and the medium's not supposed to be there because Saul himself had pronounced a decree that there should be no medians. Um, we have Elijah. Elisha, if you continued west off this picture to the right, you would come to Megiddo, which is Armageddon. And then a little bit further is Mount Carmel where Elijah had the showdown with the priests of Baal. And of course, look where this picture is taken from. This picture is taken from Nazareth. So growing up, Jesus would have had a view of all of this amazing history um, and just taking it all in. I can only imagine. One of our older videos is called Views from Megiddo, and we did that during our Revelation series. And I go through each of these sites in greater detail if you're interested. Um, it's just a, it's a fascinating area, and, and the, the bad part is we don't get enough time to spend there. You could probably spend a whole week just in this area. You've got Gideon, uh, the stream where he uh, winnowed down his army to down to 300 and then the the uh, the attack on the Midianites that he had there um, uh, Naboth's vineyard is in the town of Jezreel right in the same area so lots of lots of great stories and great history comes to mind when you're in this region so this image shows a gate in the foreground. It's clearly not the same gate. It does help us visualize the scene. And there is Mount Tabor raising uh, in, in the background. 
So as it would be today, and remember what I said, you've got these two large entourages kind of meeting head on, and you have to imagine a, a narrow road. One of them is going to have to give way, and believe it or not, there were actually protocol <laughs> that uh, who had to give way in what situation. Now, a funeral would always have the right of way, except for two exceptions, uh, and this, these are recorded in the Talmud. A wedding procession means the funeral procession has to give way, and the king of Israel has to uh, cause the, the funeral procession to give way. So the rightful king of Israel has just shown up, and we just got done talking in Matthew's version about a wedding banquet. So guess who has the authority to interrupt the procession? That is Jesus. He's not breaking any rules here. Uh, even tradition, he's following along with that because he is the, the king of Israel, the rightful king. And also, as it is today, when a parent, let alone one who is already widowed, has to bury a child, it is especially tragic. So we're seeing in these two stories with the centurion's a servant and the widow here, Jesus is showing us his humanity and his compassion. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion on her and said to her, Do not go on weeping. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. And that is another direct reference to 1 Kings 17. This is Elijah this time, not at Shunem, but up in Zarephath in modern Lebanon. So we've got these two raisings of, uh, three actually raisings of the son, Elijah, Elisha, and now Jesus. Jesus references this episode with Elijah at the Nazareth synagogue, and that had a, a negative reaction. But here he says, gave him back to his mother, the same Greek in the Septuagint, which is the translation of the Hebrew Bible that was done a couple of hundred years before Jesus uh, gave him to his mother. It's the exact same phrasing there. There are actually 10 resurrections recorded in scripture. We tend to think resurrections are pretty common. There actually weren't. Um, Elijah did one. One, Elisha had two, and remember, Elisha asked for a double portion and was granted to him. Jesus, before his own resurrection, had three resurrections, including the one here. Um, then Jesus had his own resurrection. Peter had one, and Paul had one. And then the multitudes came out following Jesus' resurrection. That was a total of ten. So by touching the coffin. Jesus would have been ceremonially unclean for seven days, but instead Jesus makes this man clean with his touch and he gives her back to, uh, gives him back to her son, her mother. Fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God saying, a great prophet has appeared among us. And this is a theme that's going to include, uh, continue in part two, because in that day, they thought the days of the prophets were gone, and yet here is Jesus fulfilling in part uh, the, the, the office of a prophet. God has visited his people, and this report about him spread throughout all Judea and in all the surrounding region. So remember, they're calling him a prophet in the geographical context of Elijah and Elisha. So I think that is very significant. And now apparently word of this resurrection miracle is going to spread far and wide, and it will go all the way down to Machaerus, which is in modern-day Jordan, and will come to the ears of John the Baptist and he will come back with a question for Jesus and we will break here and pick it up in part two with that question and Luke 7 verse 18. So we'll see you back for part two.